Well, let's go to the throne room of grace. Hallelujah. Where we can find everything that we need. Hallelujah. For God, you are good. Hallelujah. We say it all the time, oh, Father God. You are awesome, oh, Lord. But let this come out of our mouths when we go through trials and tribulations, oh, Father God, that you are still good, oh, Lord. When you allow the tribulations to come upon us, oh, Father God. But we have to trust you, oh, Lord. Trust your strength, oh, Lord. Trust your wits, oh, Father God. Because we will be seen through this, oh, Lord, with your strength, oh, Lord. Give us strength, oh, Father God. Enable us, oh, Father God, to still see you on the other side, oh, Lord, as we go through, oh, Father God. So we thank you for this word going forward today, oh, Father God, where you will give the hearers, oh, Father God, something to ponder on, oh, Father God, something to think about, oh, Lord, and then they will take action, oh, Father God, because we all need to take action on this, oh, Father God. We are tried each and every day, oh, Lord, of our past, oh, Lord, we are tried. So again, oh, Father God, strengthen us. Give us spiritual ears to hear, O oh Father God, what that said the Lord through me, O oh Father God, as I diminish myself, O oh Father God, and allow the Holy Spirit to work through me, teach through me, give me insight on whatever it is that you want me to say to your people, O oh Father God. This day, O oh Lord, I release myself to you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Have your way in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Nemus. Part one. And you know, it's already the second week of June. We're hitting the half year mark of 20, 2022. Of 2022. Again, I'd like to congratulate all the graduates. If I have any in the house today, hallelujah. Graduating and enter, entering into this real world, for some of you, I know it seems so exciting. For others, it seems so scary. There are new ventures and opportunities to explore. You will meet new people and build stronger relationships with the people you already know. So let me tell the graduates, it has been my experience that as you enter into a new ventures and opportunities, you will encounter people that are good, people that are bad, and some that are ugly. How you handle these encounters will help you grow in grace or grow in bitterness. So let me ask you a question this morning. What do you think is one, one thing the enemy will use to snare our growth? And before you answer it, you're thinking now, right? Let me give you a clue. A person gets offended or betrayed. What emotional feeling comes next? And it begins with a you. You guessed it, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. If we are going to really stand strong in our victory over the power of sin and emerge with the power to win others, we must continue to grow in our understanding on the importance of forgiveness. Some believe that we have a, a right to be angry and not to forgive because you don't understand the hurt that I went through. And I had to ponder on that a lot. I had to go to the scriptures and I had to get an understanding that everybody's Tribulation is different. But we still serve the same God with the same word. And he said that he controlled that. But he knew that you could make it through, no matter how difficult it was. You're living. But you have to forgive. You truly have to forgive no matter how hard and how hurt you were, you have to forgive. Because as we go through the scriptures, you're going to see that if you don't forgive, then he can't forgive you. That's his word. 
is no matter how we feel. At home, do you hear me? It doesn't matter who hurt you, how the hurt have taken your life away from you. You have to forgive that may, you may live. Unforgiveness is a nemus to our spiritual growth. The second slide, please. I missed the first one. See, when we talk about this unforgiveness, it just don't talk to you. It talks to me, too. I'm helping myself as I help you because we're all human. A position doesn't make you overcome the things that you have to go through. We all have to go through different things in life. A nemesis is defined as the inescapable agent or someone or something's downfall. Now, we all have a lot of downfalls. Some a couple, some several more. During my years of pastoring, I have witnessed way too many Christians let unforgiveness become their nemesis and stop their spiritual growth. They become stagnant in the work of the Lord. And eventually, some walk away from God altogether. Remember King Solomon? He said it in the Songs of Songs in chapter 1, verse 5, or verse 15, excuse me. He said, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom." Think about that when something is in bloom, it's coming alive, and something comes to steal something from it. Listen, this is a vivid of an addressing the fact that little things can wreck relationships. Marriages aren't usually destroyed by major issues or events. Rather, they are harmed by the little things that go unaddressed. Over time, they will grow and cause relationships to decay. You know how you hold things against your spouse? You don't let them know how you feel? And that begins to build as the mountain. And pretty soon, it, 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 you have a, so much unforgiveness that you can't forgive them of anything. And yes, you don't have to tell them everything that gets on your nerves. You can just let it go. Let it go is not that critical. Little things. They might be a big thing to you, but they're still a little thing. You know, it's a lot going on in this world. We get over one tragic incident, and then it's another. And these things can cause our hearts to harbor unforgiveness. So today, I hope to get you to identify and to catch your own foxes before it's too late. We can all find reasons to justify why we should not forgive. You don't understand, Pastor, but I'm not the one that you need to forgive. God is the one. However, if we are going to be true, true disciples of Christ, then we must follow his directions to rid ourselves of the nemus of unforgiveness. Imagine if we didn't hold on to that. I know you can justify, but your actions show otherwise. When you pull back and you don't do the, the things you used to do for God because you honored him, because something happened, and you can't let it go. And it's really changing the person that God is trying to complete. You're pulling back from the Lord. Turn with me to my, or to our foundational scriptures this morning. When you try to clean your heart out and make sure you're cool, you go through some things yourself. 
You don't always have to go to the person because sometimes they don't even know you holding animosity. You just get it fixed with the Lord and you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And then I will go to verses 14 and 15. I'll be reading from the NIV. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. The catcher that we don't remember, 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, how are you going to count? Jesus answered, I'll tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So this week, as you begin to study and doing your studies, continue to go through Matthew and Colossians. This will help you. Maybe someone haven't attacked you yet, but it's coming. Ammunition is vital in this type of warfare. The spiritual ammunition will help fight back the enemy. Today, I will be teaching on the what. The what. Next week, it'll be the why and the how. Let's begin our study with the what by accurately defining of this word. I know we all think we know what forgiveness is really is, what it really is. Yeah, until we really have to forgive God's way. We all forgive in our own way, right? Okay, I forgive, and you just get on. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, sis, you want to go here like we promised? Oh, no, I got something to do. Whatever that's something to do is nothing, but it's not with you. The other person hangs up the phone. I thought they were cool. I told them my situation and why I couldn't repay the money. There's always money in it. <laughs> no, you're right. See? See, I know it's some other things. What exactly is Forgiveness. Well, the, on the onset of this lesson, we needed to realize that understanding forgiveness can be very difficult for us because of our culture. Genuine forgiveness is so uncommon. I didn't want to get into this, but everybody understood the temperature the last four years in the president's house. And that temperature rose, and it almost eroded our country. We didn't see any forgiveness in the White House. In the country, is it forgiveness? It is more common to be unforgiven than forgiven. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey writes that unforgiveness plays like a background static of life for families, nations, and institutions. Unforgiveness is sadly our natural human state. We nurse sores, go to elaborate lengths to rationalize our behavior, 
perpetuate family feuds, punish ourselves, punish others, all to avoid the most unnatural act of forgiving. That shows me a person in their mind, they're going through so much. They take something and turn it all around to their favor. And they justify their act of why they did what they did. And when they tell others their story, it's always about the other person. Now, people say they buried the hatchet. But they almost always keep a map that carefully marks the spot where it's buried so they can dig it up when they need it. And it could be years down the road. We nurse our grudges as if it were our precious children. And holding on to a grudge like this is the opposite of forgiveness because to forgive literally means, slide three, forgive to release or send away, to let off. Slide four, forgiving is choosing to be committed to not let feelings or resentment come between us and those who have wronged us. We got to choose. You got to purposely choose. Purposely not allow the hurt to overtake. Purposely. So your mind have to understand what forgiveness is actually all about. That tells me a lot when Jesus says 70 times 7. Think about that. That's continuously. I have no right to hold a grudge. Now I'm talking about me. I don't know about you. I said we justify our acts, don't we? But it doesn't make it right. Well, since forgiveness is not the norm, then perhaps the best way to truly understand what is it is it to remind, it reminds ourselves of what is not. And one thing forgiveness is not is forgetting. Because if we forgot, we wouldn't have to continuously forgive. When people hurt us deeply, we can't simply forget it and wipe it from our minds. We don't have that ability, do you? That means you don't even know what your bank account is. Where your bank, where your money at? You would forget it, because you would forget everything. <laughs> You're right, so you know. No, determining to forgive someone means that every time they wrong you, they did a, they did to come, they did it to us, comes to mind, we forgive them again and again and again. And again, when we grow into that, we will, really would be the soldiers that God has called us to be. I know we're not there yet. This will stop the devil from coming in and setting up shop in your mind. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, literally says, keep on forgiving one another. Slide 5. So forgiveness is continuing, is a continuing process. I think this is what Jesus meant when he told Peter that we are to forgive one another, not seven times, but 70 times. Forgiveness is something we do over and over and over again. It is not forgetting. In fact, actually has more to do with remembering. What makes forgiveness possible is recognizing and remembering the Lord has forgiven you. Sometimes we forget that. It's like forgetting where you come from. Forgetting what you did an hour ago. Forgetting what you did last week. How you was feeling and all the words you were using in your mind. There is an inseparable link between forgiving and recognizing that you've been forgiven. I used to teach on that a long, long time ago, 
over and over again. How your mind will keep you in bondage if you don't let things go. And then when it's time for you to be forgiven, you won't receive your forgiveness because you knew how long you held that unforgiveness to someone else. To refuse to forgive, in fact, is to burn a bridge over which you must cross. You understand that? That bridge that you must cross, you'll burn it down. And then you look and say, well, I got to cross over to get to safety, to get to freedom, to get to heaven. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two people. But an injured party can forgive an offender without reconciliation. We can forgive someone even if they don't ask or even want to be forgiven. And then forgiveness is not condoning or dismissing either. It doesn't mean what you did was bad, but it doesn't mean really it didn't matter. Because if something doesn't matter, then forgiveness isn't needed in the first place, is it? Because it didn't matter. Two hours later, it matter. No forgiveness involves taking the offense seriously. Not passing it off as not important or insignificant. Forgiveness acknowledges the act as being wrong and forgives it anyway. There's a great deal of grace in the act of forgiving someone. Do we really walk in grace? Forgiveness is built around the root word give, which should tell us that is something that is undeserved, like a gift. I guess I undeserved any gifts because I haven't had a gift lately, sweetie. That was a good one, wasn't it? <laughs> but see, that wakes up your senses sometimes. So now you can get a gift sometimes, brother. You see, out of the blue. It's all good. See, I help y'all and you don't even understand it. Forgiveness is also not a pardon. A pardon is a legal transaction that releases an offender from the consequences of an action such as a penalty. But one Christian author writes, slide six, please. You can you can forgive a person and still insist on a just punishment for the offense. We get caught up with that. That's because they murdered my kid, and I'm going to court, and in my heart I want to forgive, but I feel if I forgive, the, the sentence might be light. I believe we still can insist for the because that's the law of the land. But I can still forgive him that I'd be free from him. Why hold a grudge? It's not going to help my kid. The love is still going to be there. Another thing forgiveness is not is easy because that isn't easy. It can be extremely difficult to forgive. Perhaps this is one side effect of our sinful state. Forgiving someone seems to go against our grain. Because in that instance, that's, we don't do that very easily. I heard it said that a person can hear over a hundred sermons on forgiveness and still not forgive easily nor do they find themselves easily forgiven. And we are Christians. And by faith, we came through salvation and was forgiven. But because we hold grudges and unforgiveness in our heart, it's hard to, uh, for us to accept God's unconditional love. Forgiveness, we discover... It's always harder than the sermons make it out to be. 
I'm telling you, it's not, hard, it's not easy. It's hard in your own power. The movie Dead Man Walking tells the true story of how an unsuspected Catholic nun became the spiritual director of a death row inmate. Throughout the movie, the prisoner, who was convicted of a brutal murder of a young couple, does little to make us identify with him as a human being. He is sickening and repulsive, yet this nun, Sister Prejean, continues to guide him, hoping somehow to touch his soul. Finally, she leads him to an act of regret and repentance, and as a result, he declares to the parents of, this, of his victims, I hope that my death gives you some peace. You know it won't. For the parents of the young girl, there is no peace. They have only hate in their heart. And their reaction is understandable, even natural. But the father of the young man is not as hardened. He attends the graveside service for the murderer, but stands at a distance. Sister Prejean goes to him and tells her, goes to him and he tells her, Sister, I wish I had your faith. She replied, it's not faith. It's a lot of work. And forgiveness is hard. Are we willing to work? Because we have to work at it. It's not something that comes because I heard a good sermon. It's not something because I wrote down all the scriptures. It's something that you have to work on. You have to be purposeful about it. Let's be honest. Forgiveness does not come easy to us. However, however, it's not impossible for us, as Jesus states in Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We are new creatures in Jesus Christ. We got to let the world stuff go. The world is full of revenge. You do me wrong, I do you wrong, but I'm going to do you wrong harder. We got to stop that attitude. We got to stop it. We got to stand up straight and say, Lord, I don't know how long I have to keep going through this. Be honest, but I'm going to forgive them as long as it takes because I know you got my back front. You have me totally. And I'm going to do as your word says, but you got to be purpose, purposefully about it. So you got to work at it. And that will give us power over sin, over our sin nature, and the power to choose to forgive. The good news is we don't have to do it in our own strength. The Holy Spirit will bring the words of Colossians back. To your remembrance. Remember chapter 3, verse 13. Have you have, no, you have the ability to forgive whatever grievance you may have against another. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? I know we don't want to deal with that because you don't understand how I hurt, how that messed up my life. Well, you got an opportunity to change today. I believe if each of us would truly let this scripture renew our minds and hearts, it will transform us. We will quickly remember we must forgive others as the Lord forgave us. Remember, unforgiveness is our nemesis to our spiritual growth and can hamper God's will for our lives. We do, or why do I say that because in a nutshell, unforgiveness is a sin of disobedience. Most of us know the story of Samson. Delilah was his nemesis, or was she? She was the catalyst to his disobedience, which led to his destruction. Disobedience was truly his nemesis. I don't know 
if he held unforgiveness towards her. But on the surface, it may seem like he had a good reason and he was justified. But he's not, and he wasn't. He simply needed to obey God. So let's learn a lesson from Samson. And no matter who does anything to us, let's, uh, let us not let that be a catalyst for our disobedience. To the words Jesus spoke to Peter, and that is to forgive and keep on forgiving because the Lord keeps on forgiving us. Amen? Amen. That is not a popular message for me, but that is a message that will help us overcome, to get stronger, to recognize the power of God. Because in our culture that we live in, it's always about revenge, to don't let someone put you down. Don't let someone get over on you. But if we said we were bought with a price and we're not our own, don't we have somebody overseeing this whole thing? So the question is, do we trust him or not? That would be the question. Even though some trials and tribulations have faced you guys right now, do you trust God? And I know you do because I see your actions. You pressed to get here this morning, didn't you? It wasn't easy, but you did it. 83, almost 83, and 84. I know you 84. And still pressing. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet, please. If you can, if you can't, stay there. No worries. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and releases and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow brings death. So as we ponder in our hearts, either online or in the house here this morning, I would ask the question, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord or Savior, by this lesson this morning, I hope that you recognize you need a Savior. You need someone greater than yourself. He won't condemn you. He's designed to love you. He's designed to forgive you of all of your sins if you're willing to ask. Oh, <laughs>